So a lot of times we get the question of how many people have been vaccinated? How many people have you vaccinated? And really it's not about the quantity, but the quality of the experience. We are about relationship building and that's why we are doing what we're doing. It's not just about COVID vaccination right now. We are looking at engaging with this community because someday we will come back to them or every day we are interacting with them on uh, at different levels on different topics. So this is all about community building and not waiting for a crisis to happen before we come together and say, what do we do? But to have this sustainable. And this is something that was, is going to apply to many facets of our community, many challenges, many inequities in our community. So with that, Trish. Absolutely. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Pam and Lisa. And I think um, when we talk about that impact that we're having on this, and then that question that whether it's a monthly report back to HRSA or to our county government about how many, what were those numbers, what ended up happening? Um, we look at this, certainly we want to find out how many people came. Was it a first dose? Was it their booster? Um, where did they come from? How did they hear about us? But most importantly, we ask ourselves how many lives have been impacted? And we've taken on the phrase that this vaccine is about impacting generations to come. We've also worked on the idea, and as you've heard throughout the afternoon, that this is really about creating belonging and really finding ways to connect. And as a community health center person, we know that there are so many wraparound services that people come in and need, particularly in light of the pandemic, whether it's behavioral health, if people are experiencing homelessness, if there are challenges with transportation or access to health care, food insecurity, what are things that we can do when people are coming in that we can make sure we're connecting up with this? We never want people to feel like we've scooped them up with nets and brought them in and just given them the shot, but that we've really looked from a holistic approach of what can we do and how can we really respond. Um, as Lisa was talking about sort of the fervency of the planning and knowing that we've done over 50 vaccination events over the um, past you know, year and a half, it's like wedding planning true wedding planning, where you have some well-behaved brides and some not, but really a fervency of getting it done, but a celebration, because this is really all about bringing people together. And that thought about these vaccinations are really impacting future generations gives us kind of a leg up that it's no longer a requirement or something you have to do. But as we've changed our messaging and looked at, at it through an equity lens and a way to really connect and mobilize with the community, it was a personal responsibility of how can you really feel like you're making a difference in your community. Next slide, please. And many of you are, or all of you, I'm sure are very familiar with the social determinants of health. And I love this slide and thank you Kaiser Family Foundation for um, letting us use this all the time to say, who are our partners that should be there as well? Knowing that vulnerable populations are really impacted by these social determinants of health or lack of access to the services who are there, we use this as our roadmap to really figure out who we'd like to have, one, as a partner, two, who needed to be on site, and then what were the needs of the community? So we, as we look at this, whether it's health access or working with a library around getting books into hands of multicultural children, figuring out ways to address safe Safety, the built environment and other types of things. But ultimately, this is about changing the healthcare system because now what we're doing is empowering and working with people. So they become not recipients of care, they become full partners and participants in their care. And as we look at this from a broader identification, and we said at the beginning, revolution and transformation, this is really about moving collectively forward with the community. And certainly finding ways to bring in diapers, finding ways to bring in toothbrushes, linking people up to affordable and accessible health care or health insurance, and taking this information and figuring out how it can be an engagement strategy and also a way to do warm referrals in the community, but a way to really make sure people never feel like it's a one and done. Thank you for coming. Who knows when we'll see you again, but really how are we beginning to build that relationship? Because once we start addressing the health equity, let's start looking at jobs. Let's start looking at moving the community forward with housing opportunities and other types of things that this is really, again, just the beginning of building this healthy community, starting at the individual grassroots level and really moving forward. Next slide. 
So when I look at these pictures here and each one of them, and I love the intent of having so much visual in this because each one of the photos on this one talks about one of the experiences that they have. And, and I'm just gonna share a couple of the ones that really stand out to me. And they're, I'm a, I'm a very sort of visual and kind of sensual person in the sense that one, a couple of months ago, we were at a methadone clinic. The sun was rising over the highway. We were outside at 4.30 in the morning. You could smell the coffee. The food truck had arrived with soul food. Cars were coming in. People were coming in with their children as they were coming to get their, their methadone. There was a man who was completely tatted up in the front crying. He had just received information that his dad had died in Las Vegas the night before of COVID. And he was completely hesitant about needles. Ironically, he was completely tatted with both sleeves done. And as we started to talk to him and through his tears, he said, well, I guess it's a message from my dad because he died and I should probably get the vaccine in his honor. He took his methadone and came over and he asked if one of us could hold his hand because of his fear of needles. And as he's sitting there and the environment of a parking lot with a little bit of trash blowing and people being there, opened up the opportunity to engage, engage with him at a human level for the grief and the loss of suffering that he was experiencing from a family member dying that so many people have. The fact that he's trying hard to remain in recovery and then made a decision in honor of his father to become vaccinated. Those types of moments spread as we worked in mobile home parks, on hot dusty afternoons with Mexican ice cream being scooped in a food truck that smelled of fajitas and people getting winter coats, even though it was 90 degrees and kids running around. And a young boy who ran over, who was at a parochial school who wanted to run track, but he, his mom wouldn't let him get the vaccine. And he said, but I really wanna get it because I wanna be healthy for my track season. And his mom was a Spanish speaker and she came over and she was adamant that her son was not going to get this. And we sat down to have a conversation and it wasn't as if there was a magic wand or a way to convince her. It was a connection of woman to woman, of mom to mom, sitting on a picnic table in a mobile home park to listen to her concerns and bring in one of our volunteer physicians who was there to let her health concerns be there, but also find a way to make her feel that she was connecting with other mothers who were challenged by the same fear, knowing that there might be something that might go wrong, but then getting her answers answered, getting her questions answered in a place that she felt safe. Not only did she allow her son to get the vaccine, she herself became vaccinated and then brought family and friends to our next event. As we talk about these moments of bringing people together, whether it's at a, a middle school, whether it's at the basement of an African-American barber shop, at the Longchang Market, out in the community, we're always looking for ways to not only reduce the barriers, but engage with people and find that human impact and find a way to connect with one member of the community to continue to spread that. We recently had an opportunity to be out in a rural area at an elementary school where a number of people came off the farms and there's a woman who stays in my mind. She works on a goat farm and came in to get her vaccine because she's a single mom caring for two children with autism, four-year-olds. And she said, I got the text from partnership because you said there were gonna be diapers. And thinking about a mom living in a trailer on a goat farm with two incontinent four-year-olds who will be in diapers most likely for a good portion of their life. She left with her arms full of resources and not that she was, that was enough, but she felt that somebody understood her challenge and that she was able to connect and know that there was a resource there that she needed that we could respond to and we could connect with her as a human being. We look at this work so much beyond just, again, why didn't you go to Walgreens and get the shot, but to how do we begin to mobilize and heal as a community? When we kick off our vaccine at events, and they've moved from, from clinics to events to really now community engagement opportunities, we always huddle. We talk about the logistics and where the bathrooms are and what we need to do if there's a problem and who's doing the were entry and all of which is our um, registry in Wisconsin. 
all of those things. We thank our vaccinators. We re remind people that when people come in, we applaud, we thank, we welcome. And then we have a moment of inspiration or a moment of silence or something that gives us an opportunity to reflect on some of the darkest days we've seen as a community, as a nation, and then find ways to heal find ways to celebrate, find ways to find the possibilities. I leave you with this quote, and I find it's really one that ins has inspired us and really puts the umbrella over the work that we're doing. And, and really, I think, helps us move forward. Only when it's dark enough can you see the stars. And when Dr. King said that, the world was in, in a very different place, but in so many ways, very similar to where we are today. When we look at vaccine equity efforts, when we look at the logistics and then the power of the work and the fact that we have come from some darkest days, that if it hadn't been for this public health emergency, our coalition never would have begun. Lisa, Dr. Pam and I didn't know each other prior to this work, which is a fascinating thing because we go through each day wondering how we had ever lived without each other and all of the other groups. As we both worked in our circles and all of our, you know, zipping around, our paths had not crossed until there was a moment that we needed to come together as a community to begin to respond, to act, and now collectively move forward and heal.